Hello, and welcome to Relative Pitch. We appreciate you tuning into our podcast. Our mission is to give you young musicians' perspectives on hot topics in the music world. By sharing our thoughts and opinions, we hope to help with bringing positive change and diversification to the music world. Here are your hosts, Lauren Green, Anthony Morris, and Michael Brown. Hello, welcome to Relative Pitch Season 1, Episode 6 teaching the new generations within and outside of COVID-19. As you can see, we have a very special guest with us this week, Dr. David Keeler from Kennesaw State University. Um, we are so excited to have him here with us. Uh, we all have all worked with him in very intimate settings within Wind Ensemble playing, conducting lessons, everything. He'll tell you so much more about that. Um, but this is gonna be a very fun episode having him here. Dr. Keeler, why don't you tell us about your lovely self? Oh, well, first of all, thank you for having me. It, it's, uh, it's wonderful to see three of my recent former students, and um, we'll talk more about this, but I, I'm very curious to know why and how you guys have got this started. But let, I'll start with myself first. Um, I am not from Georgia, which is where Kennesaw State is, obviously north of Atlanta, about 30 miles. I grew up in Michigan. My dad was an executive at Michigan State. Um, not a musician, but an executive. He was actually was in charge of campus park and planning. He was an architect. And um, I was fortunate and grew up at this really wonderful high school, right? It was a bedroom community right outside of the university of the college town called Okemos High School. We had one of the top high school orchestras in the country um, in a very fine um, high school band. And um, first it's my orchestra opened up came to Atlanta and we stayed at Marietta High School when I was in high school and we opened and played at the Martin Luther King Center when it opened. I met Coretta Scott King from them. And um, so growing up in a university community, I um, went to church uh, with a lot of people that worked at the university. In fact, it seemed I just that was just home. It's what I thought was normal. But um, all my parents, friends, and people would come to the house were all typically university people in different disciplines. And of course, my choir director um, in Okemos, in which I sang in choir since I was five years old, but um, she was the, the wife of Ken Bloomquist, who was director of the School of Music at Michigan State at the time. And she eventually got him, got me connected to him. And I started taking private trumpet lessons in high school with him, which is when I started to get really serious about trumpet. I was always serious about it, but but I got really serious my junior year in high school. And um, from that relationship, he sort of uh, lassoed me and uh, I was gonna go to Western Michigan on a scholarship, but he uh, pulled some more financial punches and made me, had me come to Michigan State. So um, I ended up staying kind of at home and uh, went to Michigan State, which was literally four miles down the road from where I grew up and did my undergrad in music education, although I didn't admit that I was a music ed student. Um, I only told people I was studying trumpet because I, I, um, I had this really immature perception of myself and, and what teaching is, and, and um, I didn't think people who taught high school were as serious musicians as people that were studying performance. So I was going to be, I was a trumpet performance major and I played in everything. I played in the wind symphony. I played in the, uh, I don't know what happened. My Siri just started talking automatically. Um, I played in the wind symphony, played in the symphony orchestra, played in the jazz band. And I eventually became drum major of the marching band at Michigan state, which I did for four years. Cause I went for undergrad for five years. And throughout that process, I had this conductor at Michigan state. His name was Stan Drusha. In my first rehearsal with him, I was just like, what is this? Like, I was so enamored with his incredible, beautiful conducting. And then I was like, well, maybe that's what I want to do. That's pretty cool. And so I quietly basically became a music education student by the time you were a junior. And, but I, I was very serious about trumpet. And I literally played in four ensembles a semester, which is why I went to undergrad five years. But then I wanted to become a high school band director. So I got my first high school teaching job at Bay City Western High School, which was, I still have friends on Facebook who 
for my former original students from Bay City Western High School from 1987 to 1990. Um, and I, it was a great, great first job. And um, in fact, several of my, one of my former students, her name is Betsy Brandt. She was one of the stars in Breaking Bad. She was a tenor saxophone in my band. Um, we're friends on Facebook uh, still, and I haven't seen her forever, but um, I'd love, I only taught for three years, but I loved it. And um, I was full of energy and thought I knew everything. And um, the community and the kids were very kind to me and uh, it was great. So I ended up leaving after three years. I got an assistantship actually back at Michigan State doing conducting and the directors had changed. I ended up studying with Ken Bloomquist, who was sort of my second father, my father of music. And he had me be his teaching assistant. And so I did that and then got my first college teaching job at the University of Rhode Island when I was 27 years old. And um, honestly, I wasn't exactly even sure where Rhode Island was. I, I, looked, I thought I was going to Long Island. And then I looked on the map where I was going and I'm like, oh, that's where that is. So uh, I found, <laughs> I'm not kidding. So, um, you know, it's 40, 47 miles tall and 32 miles wide. So there's, you know, only a million people in the whole state. So I uh, went out there and taught for three years. My first college teaching job, I was a marching band director and the second band director had a concert band taught, taught inter instrumental methods. And then um, went to Dallas, Texas after that and got a job at Southern Methodist University in Dallas where I was doing a similar kind of thing. <clears throat> um, and one of the first concerts I went to in Dallas was two first two concerts I went to. One was the Dallas Wind Symphony and one was the Greater Dallas Youth Orchestra, both of which are incredible. The Greater, Greater Dallas Youth Orchestras are one of the largest youth orchestra programs in the country. And the Dallas Wind Symphony, of course, is the premier concert wind band. So, Went to both of those and was like, wow. I mean, it's just changed my whole concept of what, what making music could be. And they performed at the Myers and Symphony Center, both of them in Dallas. And um, it just opened up my eyes to the professional quality of both what young people can do, high school students can do, and what, what adults can do with bands, which I'd never seen before. I've only seen college bands and a military band, but not like a civilian paid band. And just by sticking my head in there, I made friends with one of the teachers who taught one of the string groups for the Great Greater Dallas Youth Orchestra. Her name was Louise Rossi. And I used to go to concerts, she'd give me free tickets. And I kept saying to them, you guys, you guys should have a band. And they're like, yeah, we really need another band because we have all these kids that audition and we can't use all the wind players because we only have two full, or they have two full orchestras and three baby string groups at the time. Literally a thousand kids audition for this. Um, and they're like, yeah, we have to tune, turn away all, we can only take pairs of winds. And so we were turning away all these winds. And I said, well, you really need to have a band. So after about three years of nagging them, they, I met with the executive director and they decided we would do that. We really need it. Treated like the third group in where winds go. I mean, there's a symphony orchestra, there's a philharmonic, there were three baby string groups. Then we added the wind symphony, there was a choir. Um, I mean, I'd have 30, 40 bassoons audition. I mean, crazy. So, um, and the best high school flute playing I've ever heard in my life is in Dallas, Texas. It's crazy. It's like flute competitions and it's just, I mean, you just can't believe how well they all play. So I didn't tell the organization this, but, but I had a whole idea in my mind of what I want to do with this Youth Wind Symphony. They thought they were having like a third or fourth theater group in the orchestra, but I really wanted to create something within that organization that stood on its own. So the first thing I did was had a meeting with the executive director of the Dallas Wind Symphony, whose name is Kim Campbell. Kim's a guy and I said, Kim, I'm starting this Youth Wind Symphony and I want the help of the Dallas Winds. And he said, we'd love to help. Here's what we can do. All your kids will get free tickets, two free tickets to every concert for the concert season of the Dallas Winds. And I asked them if they would be our sectional coaches and they said, yes. And then I said, I really wanna have a side-by-side -side concert. And they're like, well, 
we'll see about that. And I said, well, I really would, we really need to do that. So I got to know Jerry Junkin through going to concerts and through that stuff. And then eventually we had a couple of meetings and I convinced him and convinced them that this would not only be a great educational thing for them to do, but it would also help increase ticket sales. So starting in 2001, we created our first collaborative concert and that was became on the Dallas Winds concert season. So their January concert has been dedicated to the Greater Dallas, Greater Dallas Youth Orchestra Wind Symphony. Play first third of the concert, Dallas Winds play the second half or second bit, and then we combine and do a combined piece or two, which is also a wonderful experience. Um, like we did Miss Lenka Four combined with high school students. Uh, we did, I mean, crazy hard music and it was just fantastic with 110 musicians and then Jerry would conduct a lot and of course the kids loved it and and um, we would uh, set up my we'd have these con um, ticket we incentives for my students to sell tickets and get them engaged and teach them about entrepreneurship and how to get connected and sell tickets to help the Dallas wins so um, the Dallas Win Symphony we had different levels of if you were a third place winner, you got like two free tickets to a concert later in a backstage pass to meet the conductor and the soloist. Um, the second, pay, pl second place winner who sold the second most tickets for this combined concert um, won all their CDs. Got a copy of all the CDs. And the first place winner got to be a player in the Dallas Wins for their April concert in the section. Yeah. Yeah. So I had students in the Greater Dallas Youth Orchestra Wind Symphony who became principal players of the uh, New World Symphony Orchestra in Miami, who went to amazing conservatories all over the world. I was writing letters of recommendation to Eastman and Juilliard and Northwestern and everywhere. Um, the founder of Third Coast Percussion in Chicago, his name's David Skidmore, was in my Youth Wind Symphony. So it just was a way for me to connect with young people and the Dallas Winds, and it just created this whole incredible nexus of what I wanted to do with young people, and then for me to learn how to get connected with what's really happening in, in, the, in the wind band world. And composers and that led to my relationship and, and um, getting to know Jerry Junkin and he got to know me and despite all of that he still had me come be a teaching assistant at the University of Texas at Austin which I then sold my house and gave my dogs away to my friend because I wasn't going to be around and then I moved to Austin Texas in 2005 so I worked at SMU for 10 years and it was a very difficult decision because I didn't want to give up my youth wind symphony. And I was very sad to give up my responsibilities with the Dallas Winds, which they made me quote unquote associate conductor. I, I was conducting the fanfares that happened at every concert and did the international fanfare project. And I loved, loved, loved doing all that. I loved being affiliated with that and hearing, I loved just going to rehearsals and just doing whatever I could to be watching that organization function and be a part of it. Um, but I had to go back to graduate school. Didn't have, didn't have my doctorate yet. And I was 40 years old. So I did a crazy thing. I went back and got my doctorate when I was 40. And it was the most terrifying thing I've ever done in my career. Um, and I gave up my Youth Wind Symphony and the Dallas Winds. Well, when I went to have a meeting with my Youth Wind Symphony executive director, he said, well, what would you think if we flew you to Dallas every Sunday, would you still want to conduct? And I said, sure, that'd be awesome. So this is a paid position. You know, I got, you know, a very well paid position. So 
And then I told the executive director of Dallas when they said, hey, you know, the Youth Wind Symphony is flying me up on Sundays. They're like, well, since you're here, we'll rent you a car after you fly in and then you can drive to Richardson and then you can rehearse the fanfare of the Dallas Winds and still be involved. I'm like, okay. So that's what I did for four years. Um, I mean, I was in school full time, I, which is, means you're involved with the entire band program at the University of Texas. You have your own ensemble, you teach, you're, you're going to classes full time, every Saturday, all day long, I mean like all day long, is Longhorn Band for football. Sunday morning, I'm on a plane, I fly to Dallas, Texas, land at 1 p.m., I usually took off around 11, land at 1, get in the cab, five minute drive, downbeat at 1.15 to 4.15 with Youth Wind Symphony, hop in a car, usually go to Jason's Deli, grab a salad, and then downbeat with Dallas Winds at 7 p.m., get on a plane at 9.30, fly back to Austin, and then do it all again straight for four years. Yeah, how are you alive? Right, Still. like literally you <laughs> are what we call booked and busy. You're booked always and booked busy. And you're always busy. Like how <laughs> in the world do you manage, I mean, getting your DMA is already so much work. How did you, did you have a planner? Did you like have a drink every night? Like what was <laughs> Yeah, I didn't discover bourbon by then, thank God. Um, oh my gosh. Yeah, so, I mean, you can't sustain it forever. It's like being on the road. I guess it's, I guess I equate it to like little musician touring. You can do it though for a while. I mean, I had to be organized. Um, you know, you sleep on the plane. Um, I didn't have dogs. Um, I didn't have anything. I just had myself so I could live this very selfish existence. Um, and you can't say no. I mean, that's insane. Um, I don't think I could do it now at 56 years old. Um, but you, I mean, I'd be crazy. I mean, it was just, and, and I still miss a lot of it terribly. I still miss not having a youth win symphony and I terribly miss not being with Dallas wins. Um, um, so then, I, you know, I graduated eventually in four years and um, I went to school for a long time for my doctorate. Um, and truth be told, when I took my entrance exams, I didn't do well. Um, I had to take some remedial classes. My first class at the University of Texas was with 92 of my closest and dearest sophomore friends of the School of Music, 19 year olds, because I did had to take Baroque music for sophomores again, because I didn't pass the entrance exam. That was embarrassing. So yeah, Grandpa Dave's in the back with it. Yeah, in the back, you know, so anyway, um, I didn't, I, I, I finished my coursework within three years, not two, because I had a few remedial classes. And then I asked if I could stay for another year for my dissertation. And they said, sure, they, and it's paid for, and you have insurance, and they are very generous with what they do. So I thought, I don't want to leave this yet. So um, I stayed for four and then I applied for jobs and then applied at this school I'd never heard of called Kennesaw State. Scott Stewart, who was director of the Atlanta Youth Wind Symphony and at Emory at the time said, Dave, you need to check this out the year before because he knew where the job was going to open. And he's like, I said, well, why would I want to apply at some school I've never even heard of? Um, and, uh, he said, well, it's really growing. You might, we should check it out. So I, I you know, I did, because you apply for everything, because you're just praying to get a job, because it's really hard to get a job. And I was very lucky. I had interviews at San Diego State, uh, University of Massachusetts, Amherst, UMass, and then KSU. KSU is my first audition. And I guess because it was my first one and I had others lined up, I wasn't nervous. I was just curious about it. And came and was myself. <laughs> and you guys know what that's like and um that's what they wanted and um i really liked it here and that was back when we were 21,000 students we're now 41,000 students um when you guys left last year we were 375 that's how many more we added from covid crazy um so here i am and I did a crazy thing three years ago. I auditioned to be the music director and conductor of the Atlanta Wind Symphony, which honestly was struggling. 
and I didn't even know if I wanted it, but I knew I missed doing, I missed doing other things. Um, and I was pretty much told when I got to Atlanta by a lot of respected teachers, this town doesn't need another Youth One Symphony Day, so don't even think about starting another one, because I knew what I did before. So I was like, okay, and I was like sad about that. So um, I'm always kind of looking around, see what's going on, see where else I can stick my toe in. And so I auditioned for it, and um, honestly, uh, when I guest conducted them, I then was completely not sure I wanted to do it because it was really rough. And so they offered me the job and I said, well, here's what I think we need to do to make this grow and be what I would like to see it to be. And I, I, wanted, to, I re wanted to refine the rehearsal schedule with them. They rehearsed on Tuesday nights. I wasn't interested in rehearsing every week. I wanted people to actually come to rehearsals prepared. Um, I wanted to have an attendance policy. I wanted to play at the state convention. I had a dream to play at Midwest. I wanted soloists, professional soloists to come within. I wanted to involve high school kids and do something. And they said, yeah, we would love to do all that. I said, okay, let's try it. So uh, I just, you know, this year has been COVID unfortunately. So I guess this year doesn't really count, but um, did it for three years. At the end of our second year, we got accepted to play at GMEA, GMEA, which was a year or two earlier than I was hoping. And then that went so well, we had a pretty good tape. So we submitted it for Midwest. And to my complete shock, we were accepted as a featured ensemble at Midwest, which was supposed to have been this December. Congratulations out on that. Absolutely. And your GMA performance was so good. I was in the audience, loved it. It was so good. Yeah, you know, it, it was really good. I was really, really proud of them. And, um, you know, you really, when you're working with any group of people, you never know how things are going to go. You have ideas and plans. But it actually, to be honest, it actually developed faster than I hoped. Um, and we're getting a lot, lots of people are interested in being in the group and um, it's very, very exciting. So we're hoping and we're planning to, to be playing in Chicago in December of 21. So that's where I am. Um, that was probably 10 minutes too long. No, but, I mean, um, you had such a big career. Um, not really, I'm not really, it's all very, I mean, you go where the work is and then you figure out what you can do to, to make a difference and, and to, you know, I, um, I, I feel like I still, uh, I, I never feel like I've arrived. I'm always, I, I'm always uneasy with where things are and, I, and I'm always like, what can I do to make this better or do next to add on to this? That's just kind of how I am. I think that's the life of I, teaching and especially good teaching is, you know, we're never done with anything. Um, and you're all right. an innovator, always looking forward to the next thing. And it's been very, very good to see you do it. And I think it's affected all of us to pursue because we're, we're just starting out in our careers. And by seeing you and some other people at KSU, um, I was looking to that next level. Now you've kind of instilled it in us to always be like, all right, what's next? Where are we going next? How can we make ourselves better? How can we make the people around us? So thank you um, for really kind of just giving us that inspiration, um, especially in music. Well, well, think, I mean, you know, it's just, just from dumb luck, I've been very lucky. A lot of university jobs are in the middle of university towns, which are great. I love university towns. I grew up in one but are often not exactly near big cities. And I just, for whatever reason, uh, I lived in Providence, Rhode Island, which is a real metropolitan area, Dallas, Texas, Austin, Texas, and outside of Atlanta. So within that, there are always lots of arts and music going on. And I just, I just, I just want to be around professional musicians, which is a hard thing in the band world because we're considered kind of an academic exercise. 
And so that's one of the reasons I chose to come to KSU. Are you guys frozen or can you still hear me? We, um, that's one of the reasons I chose to come to KSU because um, a lot of our faculty are our principal win players at the Atlanta Simp. Mm -hmm. Uh oh. Did we lose Dr. Keela? Okay, he's back. I was frozen. Were you frozen? You were frozen on our end, and then you just kind of went away, but you're back now. Okay, so um, I just said I want to be around great music, and I want to be around great people that make it on every level. Um, selfishly, I want to be around professional musicians, So, because uh, that's where I learn. So that's why the, the KSU job is attractive, because like when I was teaching at SMU, the Dallas Symphony Orchestra were the teachers. And when I came to KSU, I was shocked and, to find out the Atlanta Symphony had the same sort of connection as SMU did. So that was very attractive to me. Um, and as you guys know, what I've tried to do with my job with the KSU Wind Ensemble is connect us to all those musicians. And then throughout that with composers, we often do commissions uh, featuring some of our Atlanta Symphony faculty uh, because composers are killing to work with those people. And when I tell Joel Puckett, or when I tell whomever, composer, that we're, we're gonna join this commission and it's gonna feature Christina Smith on flute, or it's gonna feature whatever, they're like, well, you know. So maybe that's, uh, I, just, I just want, I just wanna be around great music. Yeah, I mean, I think we can all like say the same in that sense. We want to be surrounded by amazing musicians, great music all the time. Um, but yeah, you you asked before, I think at the front, you were kind of asking like how we got to this point. And from you, it sounds like, you know, you had a lot of situations where you made something out of nothing, where you just kind of wanted an experience and you took it and you made it. And so I guess we kind of did the same thing with Relative Pitch a bit is, you know, we, um, it was something that came, you, you know us, uh, we're kind of, I think we're born, we were, we were born at the same time or, or with the same hip and we were somehow separated at birth. I think that's how it happened. And now we, that we're back together, it's like we can't, we can't uh, get enough of each other apparently. Um, like seriously, I think I FaceTime both of them every single day. Like, and if I don't FaceTime them, I'm texting them like t nonstop. And so, well, you know, I mean, this, this is what happens when you're in a discipline in academia. You do develop these friendships, and these relationships will be a lifetime for you, no absolutely. matter where you go. And I have the same thing with my quite One of the things that was the most fond memory of my time at University of Texas was just the other teaching assistants. It's a huge studio. There are five or six of us. But, um, you know, we all, like, one became the director at Louisiana, director of bands at Louisiana State. One became the director of bands at the University of Memphis. One became the director of bands at the University of South Carolina. One became the director of bands at Duke University. But we all still connect. Um, and they're my best friends. And they'll always be there for me, both personally and musically, if I need advice. But more than that, just as a person. Because um, you go through a lot in school and, and you can't do it alone. And just like being a musician, you, you, you need support and you need, um, you need trust and you need kindness and friendship. And sometimes you just need honesty to someone to tell you, you know, you need to do this. Maybe you shouldn't have said that or maybe you need to practice. Or maybe, maybe you're not as in tune as you think you are. I mean, you need someone who's going to be honest with you. So, um, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, yeah, we, it's a, it's kind of become so much has come from this friendship with like the School Music Student Advisory Council with me and Anthony. And like Michael was also on that council. We were all just connected somehow with administration all the time. Like we were constantly talking to someone. And um, it was wonderful for us because yeah, not only the friendship that grew out of it, but the projects and the things like from the academic um, an administrative standpoint that came from it. So, you know, COVID, hey, it's crazy. So over the summer, we were bored because there was nothing to do. And so we were just constantly like three hour FaceTime calls, like every day of us just being like, oh, what are you guys doing? And just talking about 
things from Beyonce to Wagner. Like really, it's just a huge like array of things that we would discuss. And we, I think it was, Michael had mentioned starting a podcast, I think it was him who actually, and we were kind of like, okay, whatever. Like, you know, <laughs> it was kind of like something like, all right, Michael. You know how Michael is, it comes with these <laughs> ideas and we're like, okay, Michael. Well, but here's, here's the deal about the three of you, and this is why I love this, is because you all came to school as freshmen. Now, I, I knew Michael and Lauren before I knew, uh, Anthony, because Anthony didn't, I, Anthony didn't come into my life directly until like his junior year of sorts. Um, but I think for all of you, I could say this, may, I don't want you to be offended, but when you all came in as freshmen, you, you were not even close to being the kinds of musicians that you are now. Now, no one is when they're freshmen, but, but I would also say that, that, um, the growth that all of you have made that time from where you started to where you're finished is is quite literally unrecognizable um i mean everybody's green and everyone is a deer in headlights when they come in as a freshman and and usually what i see is about the fall semester about november december of their junior year the light switches on and they either become like they're on fire and they're laser beam focused or they decided to go study something else and both of those things are um, but you guys, in a way, you're all like the same, you've had the same kind of experience. They're different, but they're the same. Um, you, you guys are all, um, very active and you're, you're, you're not just in music, but in leadership roles and wherever you are, you want to make things happen. You all aren't afraid of trying to do things and you don't wait for something to happen to you. Um, I mean, Michael couldn't play trumpet when he got to KSU, quite literally. Anthony didn't even, I mean, he was studying voice, choral music, and then wanted to do band. I'm like, what? And then, and then, you know, Lauren, you were probably the most traditional on track. You know, you knew you want to be a flute major and stuff like that. Um, but you guys have all, I, I don't know if you get it from being around each other because there's there's power in having a support system, but you're all fearless and just doing things. And um, I couldn't be more proud of that because um, no musician, nothing will happen to you if you wait for it to happen, ever. Um, I will also say this, well, one, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, out this podcast is honestly thanks to you um, because when Michael said let's do a podcast we kind of was like all right then I said um, let's do a book review and we started thinking of different books because I on one day I was scrolling through Facebook and I saw a grad assistant from um, Oklahoma State and she had like a big picture of like all the books she read over the summer. And I was like, I'm not a reader unless somebody's reading it, you know, with me. I mean, I know I'm gonna have to read these books, you know, cause I do want to go get a grad degree and everything else. So I know I'm gonna read them. Um, so I brought that to them and we just started talking. And it's because of your class, the survey of 20th century music with Alex Ross, um, The Rest is Noise. Yeah, that one. We fell in love with that book. I don't know if you really realized that me and Lo we fell in love with the book. Well, you know, um, he's got a new one that just came out too about Wagner and all the other stuff that's hot right now. Oh, oh that's funny. That's funny. I can't funny. Wait to get it. What that's a coincidence. That's the basis of this podcast. So um, one week we do something I like can't, Have you all read the book completely? Because I, I, it's on my Christmas list. We're reading it chapter by chapter. So we just did the second chapter of Tristan Court and the next chapter we're doing this upcoming week. Let so, me correct, Lauren. I'm struggling through it and they're reading. Well, here's the deal. If, it, if it's like any of Alex's books, it's like every sentence is like, what? Oh my gosh. Yes. It's so yes. thick. But um, I'm thinking of developing a class on that book. Please well, do. Well, look, show them the podcast because do and, it. because we we really do each each or every other week we break down a lot of what Alex says 
and we kind of put it into normal language. Okay. Oh, perfect. Well, here's the deal. You guys, you guys can write my notes for each chapter and what we're going to oh. do. Oh. Uh, yeah. Why don't we just be great? Like, like, this is going to come back great worth my time today. Yeah, because you guys can do the work now. I'll read the book, but you guys can do the hard work. Uh, oh my are we your grad assistants now? Are we getting? We can do that. Right? I'll buy you bourbon. Okay, that's fine. There you go. Yeah. We're good. <laughs> right. No. So yeah, it's like a, it's a conglomerate. So it's the podcast we're talking about. We have episodes like this. We're talking about major things happening in the music world, and then every other week we have we're talking about a different chapter of the book. So it's just, it's it's an amazing conglomerate of both of their informations. And I'm Switzerland of the group, so it's kind of like why not both? Yes. And we just kind of mesh it into this amazing thing. Um, but well, it, it's just like you know when you read his books, just like life. I mean most of everything is a lot of gray. And while some things are completely repugnant, some people do, even repugnant people make great art. So we have challenging times and, and, and I, I do worry about cancel culture. Um, but, 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 but I think we have to all start by talking about these things and then getting yes. things in the air and then where things go, I think are important. But to pretend like they didn't exist is wrong. Exactly. Yeah, so in my, I'm in a bibliography and research class, and we have to do a research proposal. And I chose the, the part of me that was really excited to do, to have this as our book club book, was because for my topic, I chose to do, it's called uh, Wagner and Friends. Um, like, basically, and it's talking about, like, the, um, what is it, the conservation of music within the age of cancel culture. And so it basically in this research proposal, I'm breaking down saying, okay, so we have all these amazing conductors, composers, musicians who have done some no-no things. Um, but then do we take the art away from the public because of it? Or do we separate like Here's the musician, the artist from their, you know, the art? I, yeah, I think these are really hard questions. That I don't, I think, I don't think anyone should pretend they have all the answers, but I think what's important important is to talk about it and try to keep an open mind. I would, I would say that as one goes through the lens of time, if we knew everything about everybody, there probably wouldn't be a whole lot of art that you could, you could, you can consider pure enough. So I think we have to be careful because all human beings are flawed. Now, on the same way, I think transparency and knowledge about everything also brings light to art, even if it's got an ugly side. So we shouldn't pretend that it's not there. I, 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 don't, I don't know, everyone's terrified of cancel culture. And if you talk to anybody in academia, me included, no one wants to touch this with a 10 foot pole because it's, it, you're gonna, you might say something that might offend somebody. Everyone's terrified. I don't even know how to speak with correct gender language right now because I'm afraid I'm going to uh, offend someone. And, and if we can't even talk to each other about things and look at our political climate, then we're never going to solve any issues or come to any sort of at least acceptance of knowledge. So I hope we get to a place where it's not too scary to talk honestly. And we want that. Like, I feel like our generation is like, and especially the one below us is the Gen, the Gen Z's are really huge on wanting to educate like people about, okay, this is, and like, I'm not the person to be, get offended quick. I'm just like, okay, so I'm going to tell you why some person, somebody might get offended by that in the correct or the proper respectful way of saying or going about such a topic, yada, yada, yada. But yeah, the problem is nowadays, it's like, you don't, if you say the wrong thing, everyone like wants to jump down your throat about it, you know? Whereas some people, they just don't know. Like I, my parents are older. My mom is like, uh, like getting closer to 70, Like she doesn't know all this stuff. I have to be the one to tell her like, hey, that this is no, different. It definitely doesn't make her a bad person for not knowing because there no, are generations. Absolutely not. But, but when you, when, when people make them like, if you say something that's either perceived by some or many as being offensive or inappropriate for not the intention of doing so, then that's a problem too. But I, I think, again, I think it, we, we, 
we've created such barriers. And this is one thing I worry about. Human beings are so often so anxious to claim their individuality of what makes them unique, or if, if um, as human beings, I, we're, we're like, look at New York City. There are all these neighborhoods, the, the Italian neighborhood, and, and where everybody comes from in different ethnicities and different countries. People want to be around people like themselves, and that's not a bad thing. I think it's human nature. Also, and having pride in that, that also doesn't mean that you don't value other people's stuff and other people's uniqueness. But I also feel like we're also in a time, unfortunately, where everyone has to identify what makes them unique while other, that's more important than what makes us all human. I worry about that. Yeah, that's a, that's a, I now I have a question for you, going back to more of the, about the, the teaching aspect. How has all these new changes with like, I guess, social things, gender things, like um, all of this stuff, how has it affected your teaching from when you started and now? Um, well, I, I uh, changed my syllabus. Uh, of course, we're not having band this semester in person playing. We're having it, but online in a more um, Zoomy kind of way. Um, but I changed my, I've had forever and just never thought anything about it. Men wear this outfit and women, here are your options for this outfit. And I've actually had some transgendered people in my class. Uh, even seven years ago. I just never thought anything about it. And it's not to be offensive. I just, and then, so uh, I forget who it was that told me, but like a year or two ago, they listed there's like option one for clothing and option two. And you don't, and so it was never to offend somebody, but that could have easily offended someone who was either becoming transgendered or didn't feel like they were a certain binary um, way to dress and whatever. So, and I'm a gay person. So I, but you know, when I was y'all's age, if you want to hurt someone's feelings, you call them gay. That's so gay. What are you, gay? That's so gay. You know? And so you don't even hear that now because that word is now not a bad word. And young people, I mean, it's like, well, right. So, but um, we just all have to continue to have humane conversations to each other. And as, as, as generations change and grow, I mean, it's harder as you get older to stay pliable. But, but um, I mean, that's one example that, that I just changed this last year, which I should have changed 10 years ago, right? I mean, why didn't I think of that? You would think I would think of that. Yeah, it's a lot of changes. And I mean, you are dealing with um, those changes and then you get smacked with COVID going on right now. So how has um, COVID teaching, I, I just heard you say there's no in-person band classes, which is because I've seen other schools, they are trying to do something, they're doing a hybrid version, so you aren't doing it at all. Uh, we, are, we, are doing, um, we are doing all of our live broadcasts through the College of the Arts and the School of Music. We are doing performances and they're live feeds. There's no one in the audience. Um, and they're combinations of things that are either pre-recorded or live or combinations of both that create a live broadcast. I'm basically using that model for the KSU Win Ensemble concerts. Um, I'm talking to all of our studio teachers and we're doing featuring various sections or soloists that maybe juniors and seniors who either got a recital canceled last spring or whatever else. Um, and then, but basically, and then coordinating that, and some of it's pre recorded, and some of it's live. And our second concert is Wednesday night that way. Now, the sad reality is probably a third of the group hasn't had a chance to participate in that. So I can't continue with what I'm doing. Um, we've had amazing, I've divided the class into two curriculums this semester music education and music performance. And kids choose one or the other track and each guest artist every week is either a master music educator or a performing person so um like in music education we've had dick floyd well actually dick floyd's coming in two weeks but cheryl floyd and um a person with uncomposer diversity and um my mind is going completely blank uh, alfred watkins 
and people who are master at teaching middle school band and high school band. And then performance side, we've had everyone from the Boston Brass to James Stevenson to recent graduates who have gotten jobs, uh, professional players, um, just trying to give them all this, the skills. And quite frankly, this stuff is really useful and I've never had time to do it and share this information. But kids are also missing terribly playing. So my goal next semester is to do some very uh, as safe as we can chamber music um, in smaller groups with combinations of what I'm doing now to create live performances, part pre-recorded and part, but I had to get more kids playing again a little bit. But, you know, everybody's doing it differently. UGA is not going to play all year. Uh, some of my friends in other places are starting to sneak back a little, little bit. Yeah, um, Michigan State just had um, just a chamber concert literally right. a week or so ago. Um, and I will say, I have been so jealous because uh, I see your Facebook posts of all these different people and um, that you have. And I'm like, oh, I wish uh, I could, you know, just sneak in just to hear some of that knowledge because those, the people that you have are so respected in both fields. And I'm pretty sure it is jam packed with nothing but great information. It is. And all the, the kids have to fill out a, a, a quick questionnaire that just is like a pointed question, like, what did you learn most today? What did you find most surprising to get their 10 point credit that week? Um, and all the feedback, I mean, of course, I always worry that they're not going to be honest, but a lot, most of them seem genuinely like, this has really, really opened my eyes to this or this. And it's really about trying to use this time that we can't play to give them as more tools to prepare them for what's next after undergraduate, whether they're gonna to go to a graduate school or go into performance or try to audition for a military band or teach elementary or middle school or high school band. And, and whether it's applying for jobs or building resumes or pedagogy or just inspirational stories of people who, who, who've done it. And there are always, there are, there have been a couple of themes that are the same we've heard from every single And that is one, be nice to your friends and your colleagues. Because they're gonna be the people that support you down the road. And if you're in performance or education, that's one of the most important things. Number two, no good things and great things come from sitting around waiting for happen. And that's everybody. And then number three, it's all about developing your ears and theory and history if you really want to teach you. And then obviously if you're a performer, like having your SHIT together so you can play, but but people people want to be with other good musicians who are good kind of people. That's what we've heard over and over again. And it seems so simple, but it really comes down to it. All these people that I brought in. Anthony are all people I've had the, just the luck of working with through my time in Texas, through my time here working at ASU. Um, and because the reason I asked them, because these are the people I want to be around. These are the people that inspire me. These are the people I want to be like. Yeah, so I, you know, the other day I was thinking about like, okay, so as a performance major, like, what do you, like, how, how do you make it? And of course, it's like, of course, practice like all the time, of course, but also it's developing connections and like knowing how to, like, it's the entrepreneurship part of it that a lot of people don't talk about. Because I remember, I think we had one class on music entrepreneurship, like, um, and it was as a, it was only given to performance majors as well. And it's funny because I, I think I hear stories of people like you and other successful musicians in life. And they're, the main thing is they're like, oh, it's because I knew this person. It's because I knew this person. Oh, we're but I was buddies with this person. And that's something that, like, I don't know if you can really put that into a course. But it's something that's, like, so important to the development of, like, a musician, no matter, like, what your actual concentration is. And it's something that you don't really hear a lot about. Why don't you, why don't you think that's the case? Or why do you think that's the case? I mean, I I don't know. I mean, maybe 
people are afraid or they don't feel like they're worthy to be around them. I just always wanted to be around great musicians just so that they would even think it was okay for me to go to dinner with them. Like, like I, had, I, I, to a fault, I put great musicians on such a pedal that I, that I so badly want to be considered someone that's worth their time to even talk to. I just want to be around that inspiration of how they do what they do. And so everything I've done is just try to put me in a position and put my students in a position where we can be in their presence and make music if we're lucky with them. I've just always been like that. I mean, I, when I was undergrad, I mean, when I was doing my master's at Michigan State in conducting, I still played my trumpet. Um, I hadn't given it up yet. So I played with, I guess that was then. I mean, Taga Larson from Chicago Symphony was who I went, he was doing his undergrad. So I just wanted to play with Taga. He was five, six years younger than me, but I just wanted to play with him. I, I didn't want to play first. I just wanted to play second to him. I'm serious. Um, so it's just how I've always been. I just want I just want to commission composers to come write music and 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 share their music and themselves and their art with our with my students. And I it's just because I'm selfish because I want to be in it. No, I mean I that what you're saying is completely like last year when we did the trumpet festival like having jose sabaha there and brian shaw and all these other great artists and them doing works with the win ensemble i'm like well i want to be in front of the win ensemble like i want to be the person asked to come do a trumpet festival and like when you put people in that position and we see like uh elizabeth costa shown uh sheree the brian brian shaw and jose sabaha like playing with our ensemble we're like oh we're making music with them. We want to be them. And I feel like yeah, that's I, like. I worry that like undergrads, especially 18 and 19 year olds, when they come in and we're not of course able to do this right now, but I just, I just never know if it's actually making an impact. Cause I just feel like, Oh yeah, that's cool. Um, you know, um, these people are here working with us. That's cool. And they just, you know, cause kids don't ever, it, it's, I can't tell if they're digging it or not. They're just, they're, you know, they're at rehearsal and they're doing their thing. And it's like, I'm like, people, do you realize how amazing this is? Like, like, I just want to like stop and shake them sometimes. Like this person is with you right now. Like, are you absorbing all of it? Are you taking it all in? I don't know. I, 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 I just, I worry it's lost on some people sometimes. From a student's perspective, I, like when we're in the heat, I call it the heat of the battle. Any semester is a battle. Like, no, it's like, how much had, time are I going to be there? Since, yeah, I know. Yeah, and when, we're, when we had Liz, it was uh, Elizabeth Costa-Shone, it was great, because we're like, oh my God, that is, that is an oboe. That is an amazing oboe. But we're also like, oh my God, I have like 10,000 papers due, and I have to practice. So it's like a mindset and where you're always, like, oh, and auditions, you know, that's a thing whenever you're trying to be a grad student no it's, and, it's stressful and you're always because all you guys are doing is thinking forward about what i need to do well so i can graduate and get on to the next thing that's yeah. natural and you that know, leads me the the one thing i will tell you this and i i was no different than you i mean i did i mean i had the empire brass with us at michigan state and i had all these people and it was like you know, I got to go to marching band rehearsal. So, you know, um, and I love, I mean, don't get me wrong. I love, I mean, Michigan State marching band is awesome. And I was drum major. It was like, I actually got pulled into an office once uh, for my trumpet teacher at Michigan State, who was Ken Bloomquist. And um, I wasn't practicing my sophomore year because I just became drum major when I was 19 years old at Michigan State. I was never a drum major in high school. I don't know why they selected me. Anyway, um, I was just in Phantom Regiment as a soloist that summer, and I was in, and I was the stud on campus, and and uh, I didn't show up for a trumpet lesson. Prepared. Okay, I was about to say, please tell me you at least showed up. <laughs> and I played a couple notes, and Ken Bloomquist stops, and he said to me. If you ever 
come and waste my time again. This will be the last lesson you're ever going to have. And I went and bitched to my parents about it and said, I can't believe, and they laughed in my face. And that was, that was a kick in the ass I needed when I was 19 because I was very sure of myself and I was playing in all the top groups and I was drumming to the marching band and I was, you know, and so, but I didn't have that appreciation, understanding of wanting, of, of, of being really present in whatever it is you're doing at any particular time. Um, the thing I learned most from Jerry Junkin, I mean, I learned a lot, but the thing I remember that, that I think of like pretty much every day is always like when you're doing music or you're doing art or you, you're around people that are doing it or whatever it is, you have to be completely present. It doesn't matter what's going on and blowing up on your email or your job or your personal life. Because when you're with Jerry Junkin, whenever he's doing music, he is completely, you have no idea. Because I said to him one time, aren't you, don't you get like, how do you handle everyone pulling on your coattails and all the things that, you, that are going on with you and your job in Hong Kong and, and Dallas and UT and I mean, it's just, but he's just like, he's like, well, it's just banned. And, it's just, and he's like, you know, he just, he's not gonna, I mean, he is not, he isn't, he is completely in every moment. And everybody has challenges in life and everybody has things that are a problem and everybody has whatever. But when you finally come to the understanding and realization, when you're making music, it's a sacred moment. And we, especially when you're making it with a bunch of other people who everyone has time and pressure and everyone needs to be somewhere, that's extraordinarily sacred. And you have to be present and really appreciate every second you're doing that because it could be going like that. Just and like it is now for us. I was about to say, we all are feeling that right now with COVID-19. I mean, I'm lucky here at Western, we do in-person rehearsals. Like, of course, it's smaller groups. But my main thing is I get to rehearse with the brass quintet three times a week for an hour. And that is just, it's been keeping me going, especially through all this academic work. But what I was going to talk about earlier or about to lead into is you've been in the university teaching job for a while, like before your DMA mm -hmm. and after. And I was going to mm -hmm. ask, what have you seen change with young students coming into college? Like, what are their skill sets? Is it increasing? Like, their skill sets getting better and better as you've grown or gone through the years? Well, or is it about the same? It depends on where you are in the country. I've, I've taught in different, lots of different areas. Midwest, Texas, New England, here. Um, I think the reality of technical playing from a broad perspective in the world and in the country, it's like sports and athletes. We have better technology that helps us play better in tune. We have recording devices. We have all these things that can help us practice and be more mindful and hearing better and all that. And that doesn't really change what you do in a performance, but the, the, all the skills and all, this, all the tools we have now compared to even 30, 40 years ago, are so much greater, I believe the amount of technical ability on everybody is generally greater. People can play higher, faster, longer now than they could more 50 years ago. And I think music in the public school realm, in the band world, is things that you, no one, no high school band could have ever thought of playing like Richard Posey 50 years ago. Now all the good high school bands can play like Richard Posey. Um, and so, within that, there are always dangers. And because of those tools, it's easy to think those can also do all the work for you. And let's take the metronome, for example. The metronomes are great in using pulse and an external source in ensembles. It can be a very helpful thing, but it also, if it's used too much, actually depletes an ensemble and an individual's ability to have an internal sense of pulse, which is actually damaging 
to their musical skills, both as an individual and as an ensemble. So like all things in life, like all things in technology, just like our phones, they are amazing and wonderful and deadly at the same time. Yeah, yeah. And so with that increase of skill going into college, what kind of skills, like as a like director of bands, you're wanting your kids in the top ensemble and any ensemble in your program, you're wanting them to go out, win a job or go to grad school. So what kind of skills do you see that performance and education majors need to obtain in their like relatively short four years of undergrad? I think what I see from young people now that they have to uh, figure out between their freshman and junior year is this sense of being able to organize their time and being able to be responsible for it and not be distracted. I worry about this generation of everyone your age and younger who's grown up with technology and cell phones because everyone's attention to one task at one time is pretty much getting taken away because we're all plugged in and we're all multitasking all the time. Um, so I worry about that because you can't be a real musician and, and, and you're multitasking, but not when you're playing your instrument. If you are, you're not going to get well, be good enough. And so um, that's why musicians are going to be really successful, even if they're not doing music down the road, because the whole world is completely distracted and a musician is completely focused. And it's developing both sides of your brain at the same time. So you, you, a musician is going to be an extraordinary employee and a gift to a company who believes in collaboration and who believes in discipline and long-term investment and working hard. Um, that's becoming a harder and harder thing to find. I think when I see young people coming in when they're 18 years old to college, I think A, they're overwhelmed by the amount of classes and time that's required. So they either figure out how to organize their schedule and, and actually plan a schedule, which means planning your rehearsal and your practice individually mm -hmm. and sticking to it um, because they didn't have to before. And, and, um, and then also just figuring out whether this is really Everyone comes into music because they love it or they, or they really, really liked it. Well, what I tell high school students is when they're going to recruiting high schools, if you really, really like music, you absolutely must stay doing it and you need to join a major ensemble in college. Please do not quit. It'll bring your life satisfaction. You have to stay doing music. But only if you love it and you can't live without it should you be studying it as a degree because it becomes a job and then it becomes really hard. And if you don't love it, you won't like it anymore. I uh, remember you asking me that in my audition at KSU. Mm -hmm. It was like the little interview after I played and you were like, I'm reading, your inter I'm reading your essay. Do you really love music or did you just idolize your band director? Mm. And I was like- Was that wow. what I said? Because you talked yeah, about- it was, it, was, it was something like, because I, I wanted to be a high school band director. And as we all know in this chat, I could not be a high school band director. I would, I would be asked to leave the premises very quickly. Yes, you could, but anyway. <laughs> I think Anthony has something to say. Um, based off of what you just said, do you think um, that leads to burnout for teachers? Because I mean, uh, if we look at the people who are graduating undergrad in their first five years, not a lot of them are staying after that first five years. And it, do you think it's because they, like Michael said, maybe idolize their band director, choir director, whoever, and is not truly in love with music? Um, what, what are your thoughts on that? Well, the reason I'm doing a band director is because of my band director. So I don't think that's different. Um, you know, and then I got my, my bottom kicked along the way to become a serious musician and then become a, a, a good enough educator. Um, we all have to have outside inspiration. So I don't think that's the problem. And I think people have always not stuck with it to a certain degree. I think the challenge though, the biggest challenge in, in public education is I had the last 10 or 15, 20 years has been the testing regime and all the stuff on the outsides of what we try to do the music that takes away from actually teaching at all levels, including the arts, which is damaging to our students, and damaging to our culture. I am hoping that pendulum is starting to shift away again. Um, but I ultimately agree about COVID because in the arts in general are, are going to suffer. I 
Yeah, um, COVID has not been the best thing, especially right now, teaching public school right now, the amount of kids that are not even in my class because, you know, they're uh, either virtual or whatever. Oh, you guys froze again. Uh-oh. Are you froze? We can hear you still, I believe. Yeah. Can you hear us, Dr. Keeler? Oh, I think he's coming back. He's going to come back. Yes, yes, yes. Well, hi, guys. What were you saying before that, Anthony? Um, what I was saying was um, it is very, a lot of my kids aren't even in band um, because, you know, they're, they're gone. And it's really kind of crazy because those kids are, you know, not here anymore. Um, and I can see it's a very big detriment to win band, to music in general. If they're not in, uh, you know, middle school, high school, I have lost probably half of the people that were there last year. I don't even have those kids and this is my first year. So it, it's, it's a little sad, but I'm always looking forward. I, I'm like, every day I'm like, come on, come back to band, you know, everything. Um, I'll see. This is everybody. This is everybody, Anthony. And, and, and people, there will, there'll be people that don't survive, but if you choose to survive, if you choose to look forward, what will happen is you will rebuild when we're finally back out of this and everyone's going to be affected by it. And everyone's going to say for five or 10 years, Oh, those are those kids from the COVID year. That's why we don't have a good seventh grade class or blah, blah, blah. But so what? We can't control what we can't control, but you can control your attitude and what you want to do. And if you love doing this, you can't stop because people need it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, now, I want to shift gears just a little bit because, um, as you know, and as how we met was really through conducting. Um, and I just want to know where in the world did your conducting bug come from? Because we've talked about you you're in love with trumpet um, and then being a band director, where did, you know, conducting start to like come into play? My first rehearsal in 1982 with the Michigan State Wind Symphony under the direction of Stan Berisha, who was the director of bands at the time, we were sight reading Joe Schwantner's In the Mountains Rising Nowhere. And I remember going, okay, what is this? First of all, you, you look at the music and you're like, I, how come I don't even know what to play? Like, I didn't even know what to do. But then hearing the sounds for the first time, I was like, oh, this is what band music is supposed to be. And then seeing him conduct, I was like, oh, this is, he was such a beautiful, engaging conductor, both physically, I remember sight reading music and not looking at the music because I didn't want to miss a gesture or a spatial expression he was making. And I would play wrong notes because I, I didn't know if we were sight reading, but I didn't care. I just was like, I just wanted to watch him conduct. And when I'm with, when I was, when I would go to Jer Dallas Wind Symphony concerts, I was like, well, that's, I'll do that. That looks like an awful lot of fun, because it is. And, and both of those people, I can never even get close to being what they, have, they are and what they've been to me. Um, they have gifts and talents and, and mental abilities that are beyond my ability. But I can do my best. Absolutely. I mean, I fell in love with your conducting when I was a freshman. I was like, I've never seen such just poise, but so much passion. Like you, you, I will say both you and Dr. Blackwell, those, you two, and y'all are completely on the different spectrums of conducting. But I remember sitting in the audience looking at you, I think it was, oh, it was Russian Christmas music. I was actually up, I was like the choir and I was watching and I was like how is he doing that 
how, what is going on? And I remember I went home and you can ask these two over here because Michael lived with me and Lauren was everywhere. I would be in my room trying to recreate some of the things you were doing because I, you just really, I don't know, it was a spell over me. And ever since then, I have just, I've fallen in love with conducting because I'm always like, that looks so much fun and I want to do it. And so- Motion is about, I mean, I, I guess I view music in a very visual way. That's why I love watching violinists play because, and, and to a fault, when I used to play trumpet, I think when I look back, I always got yelled at by my teachers because I would move around too much. They're like, Dave, stop, your instrument's directional, stop moving. And I yell at Eli, Eli Rickles all the time, right? At KSU, a student, because he's moving around. Um, but, but I wanted to move when I played. And then when I see people like that, that it just looks so beautiful and it matches the music and, and it can't be about the motion because the music's all inside you. Everyone should be able to conduct differently. And, and, you know, some of the most genius conductors are people like, um, you know, Pierre Boulez, who does nothing but this and stares at the music, but he, even though he has everything memorized and knows it all. Um, and musicians love playing for him because they know he knows everything about it and he knows what he's doing and people just want to be led by people who know what they're doing. Um, so you have to know what you're doing um, and you can't have an opinion about anything until you know what you're doing. And maybe you shouldn't even have an opinion about it until you really, really know what you're doing. Um, but people just don't want their, and as, as students get older, um, especially when you're in grad school, but juniors and seniors in undergrad, they just want someone that's not going to waste their time. Right? And then if you get inspired in the process, that's a bonus. So, well, thank you, Anthony, you're very sweet, but I, I just, you know, but I love that piece. So it's, it's, it's yeah. luscious, it's gorgeous, it's just, it's just, it's just so all in the wrist, right? All in the wrist. Yes. Well, it is. This is the magic, right? So exactly. Mm -hmm. uh, me and Michael, we have all like we would be just conducting in the in our living room, just like it's all in the wrist. We take that like too hard. It was funny. I think the favorite piece that Lauren me and Anthony like to recreate of yours. Your one of your famous moments was the end of collage, twenty eighteen. I think it was Hinastera, oh, and you were just you were just smacking that down. Yeah, the dogs the down. The, and you're like bam, bam, and I'm like <laughs> me and Lauren, we'll be just like we'll be getting in the car, we'll be hitting it. Yeah, we're like we, hit that down. Song we that, that that piece is it's a malambo, it's a dance. Yes, yes. And, so it, and it and it has a purpose, and it's the dance to show off. For the ladies. Yeah. That's the dance. So if you're conducting it right, <laughs> you got to dance. <laughs> no, I, I, think, I think some people come to collage just to see Dr. Keeler's finishing dance of the finishing number. <laughs> well, here's the thing, though, and, and I'm sure I'm guilty of this, but it's got to be about the music first. And I do, I do think sometimes I'm guilty of... I want people to hear what's happening and not see, but 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 it, I guess if it inspires the musicians to play a certain way, then that's what you need to do. So I find that the, the younger the players, the more I need to do physically. Yeah. Um, I mean, you you inspired me who weren't even in the ensemble to like the music. I would see what you were you were putting out and then hearing the ensemble because I um, I'm a visual person, but I'm, I love to hear things as well going on. So when you really mesh the two, it's like a whole nother experience. Another piece that I really love was uh, a Bells for Stokowski. Love that piece. You did it. I know it's hard, Michael, for trumpets. I, I know. And it's, it's, this way, it's still one of my favorite pieces because I remember just being in the audience and hearing how big it is and hearing all the different colors and textures um, and then seeing you you're kind of like you're kind of like the painter who really just kind of brings all those colors in and really shows where it's supposed to be such a great experience however there are some concerts i went to um that me and michael we've actually watched on youtube and we were like that was a very boring concert 
and I it can, was I can it? It? no not you not you somebody oh, okay. somebody else not you no never never no 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 but it's boring and it the music was technically right but there was nothing that gave it a spark and i've always said kennesaw has that a spark and i don't know what the spark is but it's just like right there um and it's definitely something you can hear so that's a kudos to you like it is there it's definitely thank you, thank you. no i mean i it's just it's just fun it's just fun now when music becomes much more introspective and not dance like because all music is either a song or a dance right so when music is more of a song it's really important as a conductor you don't get away from the simple beauty of what's being told from an aural perspective when it's a dance it's about the dance it is yeah, so before, before the boys do their rapid fire uh, round of questions, um, so with, with, you know, just wrapping up the whole COVID talk, what, like, strategies and practices that you have, like, implemented during this, and you've seen other, other um, ensembles and like orchestras around the world and schools, uh, do you hope sticks afterwards, and what do you, how do you see everything the music community the music world the arts community after covid passes well we maybe the good part of all this is we've had to force ourselves to be connected electronically and thank god we have this technology because if this were even 10 years ago this would be even worse we all terribly miss our human human connection making music visually with each other and, and maybe we'll all appreciate it more maybe we won't forget although the next generation won't remember or won't know but we won't forget um, but also I think, um, I mean, in my own teaching, I, I'm, I'm already thinking of how I want to teach connecting class a little differently in the future, even if we don't have to be socially distanced when I do it, because I've, I'm having them do more independent electronic stuff that I can, that I don't have time to talk about in class that have actually proved me very beneficial that I can give them more personal critique as we go through because of the technology we have, but I wouldn't have explored if we didn't have COVID. So we're never, things are never gonna be the same. And um, I've been able to connect more with musicians and stuff and connect them more with my students because it only cost me $150 to have them come in for an hour and a half versus if I flew them in, it would cost a couple thousand. But they're also, have time on their hands because they're not working so I can do it and normal times are probably more difficult but um did I answer your question yeah 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 you definitely it was well-rounded um in the sense that yeah we all think that there it, it, there's gonna be a change like in the music community and everything I think in every aspect of life after COVID because of this and practices that have been implemented where um we like it and we're actually, oh, maybe we'll actually continue doing this because of, or we realize there are some classes really don't need to be in person for, um, and things well, that, you really yeah, don't have to be yes. in person for. <laughs> yeah, here's to all future faculty meetings online. <laughs> no, at a school like Kennesaw State, we have 75 faculty, 40 of which are adjunct and can't even be there. Now they can. Now they probably won't be, but, but it's just, why not? Exactly, exactly. Uh, fellas, you ready for the, the rapid fire round? Yeah, I got, I got a, I don't have a whole bunch of time left, so I don't know how much more time we want to talk today. Oh, so, this is what's our rapid quick, very quick. Very okay. quick. Rapid yeah. fire. All right, here we go. Under All the right. gun. Um, so what was the last thing you listened to on your device? What device? Phone, like computer. What was the last song that you listened to? Do you remember? Um, Boy, I'm not listening to a lot of music right now. Really? Okay. Oh. Isn't that weird? Yeah, that is weird. I would figure you would be listening to a lot of music going right now. Mm -mm. No, I, I am, um, I've been doing a lot more reading um, since mm. COVID. So what, what I've discovered. Yeah, well, um, I just, I just read this whole new uh, conducting text by Joe Labuda that I'm preparing for next semester and I'm redoing some courses and trying to be that way 
Um, I'm gonna, I've been listening, actually I did listen, listen to Beethoven uh, Opus uh, 99. Um, I've been listening to a lot more chamber music because I'm trying to get ready for next semester what we can do and what would work with us. Mm -hmm. So um, I got to get that figured out in the next four weeks. Gotcha. Next question. What is your favorite type of food? Thai. Um, I'm trying to learn to barbecue like Texas because uh, I lived there 14 years. So I did my first brisket on July 4th and it came out really good actually. I don't have a fancy smoker. I do it by hand with a grill and, you know. Um, I like anything that's not nailed down. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Lordy. Um, all right, next question. What is your favorite orchestra piece? Boy, that depends on my mood. You know, I like listening to music. The music I liked to play as a trumpet player was always different than what I liked to listen to. Because you know what I play when I'm in the house doing dishes and stuff? What? Boston Baroque on Pandora. Oh, okay. I, listen to Baroque. I love Baroque music and medieval and early music. That's it. Yeah, well, it's not on trumpet. It sucks. So, <laughs> but... But I love it. I, I just like the simplicity and the lightness and the, and the, and, you know, but um, probably Shostakovich's late symphonies, mm -hmm. I, 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 I think are viscerally I love, like Shasti 7 is just, yes. I mean, some of that music is, is some of the, is, is just <laughs> wonderful. So, but I mean, yeah. What is your favorite fast food place to get food from if you have to? Um, 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 Popeye's chicken. Ah, I love Popeye's. <laughs> Spicy is awesome. Yes. Um, what is your favorite steakhouse? Um, for, I mean, this might sound silly, but for the petite six ounce filet, because I don't like, is, is actually Ruth Chris and get it, uh, get it done uh, Pittsburgh style, but medium rare um, is, 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 is perfect. Um, there are some incredible steakhouses in Chicago and in Texas, and um, Three Forks in Texas is crazy. Um, um, yeah, I, I, you know, yeah, there's nothing like a good steak, but I can't eat like a Fred Flintstone style one anymore. So. <laughs> oh, my. Who is your favorite conductor for orchestra and for band? My favorite conductor for orchestra was Zubin Mehta, who was the New York Philharmonic and Israel Philharmonic. And then I got so disheartened after I was had spent time with John Corleano when we were doing recording for his piece in Texas, and I was in charge of taking him out to dinner and had him in my car, and and he was like, oh, he never learned his music. He wasn't prepared for rehearsals, and I was like, I, I just, I, I, I just, his presence in the podium Zubin Mehta and his, he conducts with clarity, like a really fine band director, but with beauty and grace and power. Um, so that's my, that was my favorite. And then, and of course, you know, watching Dudamel conduct is a visceral, exciting, wonderful thing. Mm -hmm. You know, Bob Spato in Atlanta is a beautiful, fantastic, very clear conductor. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Okay. What did you ask? Is that it? Orchestra? And band. Uh, who is a band person? Well, Jerry Junkin, of course. Oh, you know, I learned from some Jerry Junkin. Um, <laughs> well, you know, I mean, and, and I, Kevin Setatal is an amazingly visceral, powerful yes, he is. conductor, which is, I, I, I tend to fault on that side. I want to be like that. And, and he is, his energy and center of gravity and power is, 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 is incredible. Yes. Uh, all right. Uh, second to last question. What is your favorite destination spot in the world? Well, um, even though I can't be in the sun because I always I get skin cancer now because of my stupid white skin, um, is often being where water is. And so, quite frankly, anywhere on a beach is great. Um, but, um, you know, Maui was spectacular when I was there once upon a time. Um, so I'm an Aquarius, so anywhere where there's water, but I've always wanted to go to Key West and never been, but it always looks lovely and kind of chill. Yeah. 
So, yeah. Last then, question. Go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. What is your favorite wind band piece? You just asked the band director what his favorite wind band. Piece. I think I know what it is. Yeah, Joseph Schwanner's "Mountains Rising Nowhere." Darn, I was wrong. You thought it was Winston McGuall, didn't you? I did. Mm -hmm. See, I thought too. But <laughs> thank you, you know what? Thank you so much, Dr. Keeler, for coming on with us and you know speaking with us and gracing us with your wisdom and knowledge. It has been a phenomenal time speaking. Well, here's the deal. Conductors are only as good as the musicians they get to conduct. And teachers are only as good as the students they get to teach. And you guys made me look like I knew what I was doing on both. So thank you. Thank Aww. you. Thank, thank, thank you. you so thank much. You. It's, it's been true. amazing having you here. But thank you guys so much for tuning in. Um, we hope you really enjoyed this episode. Make sure to like, subscribe, comment down below, and we will see you next week. Bye. Thank you for listening and being a part of our conversation. Remember to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, and subscribe to us on YouTube, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts. We'd love to hear what you thought about today's episode, so leave us a comment or review. See you next time.